Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. What happens to a child when his father is no longer someone he feels protected by, but rather someone his family needs protection from? This time, an invisible choir. Oh my God, she was murdered. It was a murder. Went to reach for a pulse in a crowded area, and my finger went into a gaping hole. He immediately started accusing me and my wife of flirting with his wife, and he started getting hostile, sir. This episode deals with intense and at times extremely graphic depictions of domestic violence. If you are experiencing a crisis, call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. The details are in the show notes. This is your trigger warning. It was December 18th, 2016, just one week before Christmas in Commercial Township, New Jersey. It was a magical time of the year filled with nostalgia and tradition in the town of just over 5,000 residents. For children, it's an entire season of hopeful anticipation. Everything seems bigger and brighter and more impactful when viewed through the lens of childhood. Something as simple as driving through your own neighborhood, watching the twinkle of the holiday lights and bright yard displays can provide an entire evening of wonderment. The weather is crisper and colder and all your senses are heightened. Everywhere you look, your eyes are rewarded with holiday delight. There are street lamps wrapped in glitter and garland. Life-size candy canes and festive holiday bells hang across intersections in small towns all across America. For one family, this holiday was going to be extra special because it represented a new start, a new beginning. In their modest trailer, Tara O'Shea Watson shared with her five-year-old daughter and her 12-year-old son they were going to build new holiday memories. Tara had just filed for divorce from her abusive husband, Jeremiah Manel. Their family was finally protected by a hard-fought permanent restraining order against the father. This holiday season was meant to be a new beginning with renewed hope for the family of three. They decorated their small home with a tree, lights, and Christmas stockings. Together, they finally felt free and safe. But sometimes, a restraining order doesn't actually mean safety. In fact, statistically, it often means an increase in family violence. Often, a restraining order can incite the recipient into outrage and fury over the attempt at being controlled. A person doesn't want to be told what they can or cannot do by law enforcement or anyone else for that matter. In the case of Tara Watson, that is exactly what happened. While she was preparing to make new memories with her family, her abusive husband was making other, much darker ones. He intended to shatter Tara's dreams for a brighter future forever, and in one short instance brought the now family of three's entire world violently crashing down. I then went to the upper right hand corner um, raised it just enough to where I could look in. Um, what I saw was Miss Dyer's head was turned to the, the right. I saw minimal blood splatter up the side of her cheek. Eyes wide open, mouth wide open. Skin was pale, cold to the touch. Went to move the jaw and it wouldn't move. Um, I went to reach for a pulse in a crowded area and my finger went into a gaping hole. I immediately pulled the blanket back, told Jimmy to exit the residence and Jimmy had been looking over my shoulder. He was on the phone with the 911 dispatcher. He dropped me the phone and he went and exited the residence as he came in. Uh, I told the dispatcher what we had. I asked for a BLS and ALS ambulance to respond to the scene to do a pronouncement. Also asked for the crime scene unit and told them I was securing the residence and declaring it a crime scene until they could get there. For many children, violence in the home represents a dark stain on their childhood that they carry for a lifetime. Domestic violence occurs across all socioeconomic backgrounds and doesn't discriminate by race, religion, or household income. Children living in homes where domestic violence occurs often feel partly responsible for the actions of one or both of their parents. They internalize their behavior and over time can even come to believe that they could somehow control it by anticipating all of the scenarios that might otherwise trigger a violent interaction. In some instances, when a father hits a mother because he wasn't properly greeted at the door, a child can internalize the responsibility of that violent act. They take it upon themselves to make sure that the father is always properly greeted from that moment on. Likewise, if a parent becomes violent because the house isn't clean and tidy, 
That child might literally become obsessed with keeping the house organized in order to avoid a potentially violent backlash. Others might freeze in fear or simply watch in horror, overcome with feelings of helplessness and blame, the weight of those observances becoming unbearably heavy over time, and the temporary paralysis only subsiding when the violent parent is gone. On the morning of December 19, 2016, 12-year-old Jeremiah Manel, or Maya as his family called him, waited in bed for his mother's alarm to go off on her phone. When it did, he got out of bed, went to the kitchen, dropped to the floor, and cried inconsolably. Perhaps he thought the events of the night before were all a bad dream, but the reality of the stark morning light proved otherwise. He pulled himself together, got dressed, and woke up his five-year-old sister, Sarah. Maya told her that their mother was already at work, and then he walked her out the back door and towards a neighbor's house. That neighbor was Crystal Greer, whom the two affectionately referred to as Aunt Crystal. Maya's main goal that morning was shielding Sarah from the grisly crime scene there in the family's living room. He remained stoically brave as he knocked on the door awaiting Aunt Crystal's response. When she finally opened the door, she immediately asked, Where is your mom? Maya, no longer able to quietly carry the burden alone, simply responded, My mom is dead and my dad killed her. Crystal hadn't seen Jeremiah Manel Sr. at her friend Tara's house since April or May of that year. Her and Tara were close childhood friends, and she knew Tara was separated from her estranged husband. In fact, Tara had a permanent restraining order in place. But Crystal knew that despite the restraining order, Manal had been over the night before. Tara's brakes weren't working in her Ford Explorer. She needed her brake line repaired and had no alternative than to ask her estranged husband to come over and fix it. However, she was careful not to be alone with Manal as he had a tendency to get jealous and fly into violent rages. Not knowing what else to do, she asked Crystal to stay with her to keep her safe while he was present. The two didn't anticipate the repair would take more than a few hours. But Manel had arrived late afternoon between 2 and 3 o'clock, and it was taking much longer than anyone had originally anticipated. When he arrived, Manel parked behind Crystal's house and drove Tara's Ford Explorer the 100 yards over to Tara's driveway. Tara stayed at Crystal's house as long as she could, knowing that any time she was alone with her ex-husband, things could easily end in explosive violence. After four or five hours had passed, and the car still wasn't fixed, Tara and her daughter Sarah and Crystal's daughter Bella went back to the house, because Crystal had some errands to run. Crystal called Tara a few times throughout the evening to make sure that she and the children were still safe. She arrived back at Tara's house at exactly 7.55 that evening to check in on things and to pick up her daughter. She stayed a few minutes, and when she sensed that things were okay, she took her daughter back home with her and didn't come back at all that evening. Crystal went to bed a few hours later around 10 o'clock and noticed that Jeremiah's truck was still parked behind her house. While she had some concerns, she assumed that he must still be at Tara's fixing the brake line. About an hour and a half later at 11.30, the sound of Manel's truck driving away briefly woke Crystal. She assumed that meant all was well, so she went back to bed. It was winter break for her and Tara's children, and she didn't wake up that next morning until about 8 o'clock. About 15 minutes later, Jeremiah Jr. and little Sarah showed up at her doorstep all alone. Unsure of whether or not what Maya had told her was true, Crystal and her husband James went down to Tara's home to check on her and see if she needed help. Instead, they found a body underneath Sarah's favorite blanket. It was pink and covered with characters from Disney's animated film, Frozen. It was Tara's habit to use the blanket at night to stay warm on the couch. Fearing what Maya had told her was true, they cautiously entered the home, expecting the worst. My, my wife's best friend's daughter, uh, son just came down to my house, yeah. talking about his mom's dead. Yeah, okay. Just with me and my wife up there, Sarah's sleep. My wife, is, my wife is inside right now, checking on her to see if she's okay. Okay, 7901 Henry Street, you said what's going on exactly? Uh, my wife's best friend's son, uh, best friend, her son, just came down to my house saying his mother is dead. Is dead? Yes. Okay, and is she, are you there? Can you see if she's breathing? Uh, my wife is inside right now. I'm off with her. I'm not touching anything just in case. Right. Do you know how old she is? She is dead. Okay, but do you know how old she was? Uh, how old is she, Hud? I know she's in her 30s. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And 35 is her age. 35, and they just found yes. her? Yeah, my wife just found her on the living room floor. Okay, nice. And her ex-husband her ex -husband was over here last night doing brake line work on her truck. Okay. And Any injuries that you can see, or is she just... Oh, uh, hi. Is there any injuries can you see? I'm not going to want to touch her. My, my, my wife doesn't want to touch her. Okay, she's but, covered up in a blanket. Okay, so it looks like she may have passed in her sleep? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but there's no, like, any injuries to her, no blood anywhere, right? Uh, I don't see any blood. Okay. At first, it seems they don't want to believe the situation unfolding in front of them. Perhaps, instead wanting to believe that Tara may have passed away due to natural causes. But the minute they lift the blanket and take a closer look, it's obvious what occurred. Oh my god, she was murdered. It was a murder? What kind of injuries? I'm going to say with state police right now. Okay, what kind of injuries does she have, sir? Sir, hold on one I second. I need to right here now. Alright, calm down. I'm going to connect to state police right now. Okay. Hold on one second. He's at 7901 Henry Street. I said that he just found On the same day that Tara's body was found, law enforcement officials were unable to locate Manel. They wanted to question him in his wife's death. In his absence, the county prosecutor filed charges against Manel for violating the restraining order against Tara. 
The state police asked the public for help in locating Manel because they feared he may be suicidal after leaving behind the grisly scene at his ex-wife's house. Despite repeated pleas to the public, his whereabouts were still undetermined for another two weeks until a tip from a concerned resident led an officer to a nearby thick-wooded area where Manel was captured while emerging. When he was told of his wife's murder, he acted completely surprised. He maintained that he had been on an extended camping trip without access to social media or news sources. He claimed he had no idea he was the subject of an extensive manhunt. He was very unhappy about his arrest since he didn't feel like he violated the restraining order. After all, it was Tara that asked him to come over and fix her car. And now he claimed he was being unfairly charged with a crime. However, investigators were able to prove this wasn't true, and he wasn't in the woods camping for two weeks. They found a nearby hotel Manal had been staying at the entire time he was allegedly gone. He had only checked out the day before he was found. It was the first of many deceptions that would create a long and winding road to justice for Tara and her family. Nine one one. What's your emergency? Every sixty seconds, a person is murdered somewhere in the world. There was a shootout at my house. I can't believe it. What causes ordinary people to do unthinkable things? He stabbed me in my neck, and he says, "Look how easily I could kill you." The Minds of Madness is a true crime podcast that examines the most disturbing criminal minds. We shed a light on the devastating impact these violent crimes have on the victims and their families. When you get calls in the night, you know they're not good or they're wrong numbers. You'll hear about the incredible strength of the survivors and what they did to fight back. I was studying his face because I was thinking, if I get out of this, I'm going to get you someday. Subscribe to the Minds of Madness podcast today on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. After his arrest, Manel was provided an attorney from the public defender's office, but he asked the judge if he could represent himself. Manel was a difficult prisoner and wasn't cooperative during early court hearings. He told the judge, I believe my safety is in jeopardy in this jail. I've been assaulted by officers three times. I was literally choked by one of them on the way here. He also complained about being isolated from the other inmates, claiming, They're not letting me around people. I can't move around. I can't do anything. When the judge asked him questions he didn't like, he would refuse to answer. Based on his inability to cooperate with court proceedings, the judge denied his request to represent himself. Bail was also denied. At the time of his arraignment, other charges had been filed against him based on eyewitness testimony, including that of his 12-year-old son, Maya. Despite his repeated requests for contact with his children, the judge had concerns that Manel would use his influence over them as their father and tamper with the now-established witnesses prior to trial. Instead, the judge issued a no-contact order between he and the children. The prosecution claimed that he had represented a clear and absolute danger to the kids, though Manel was eventually granted phone contact with 5-year-old Sarah. The prosecution also brought up Manal's previous violation of a 2016 restraining order against Tara. During that prior incident, he destroyed property and assaulted her, leaving clear marks around her throat. As he continued to await trial in jail, Manal defied even the smallest orders from correctional staff. He refused attempts at discipline or consequences and physically resisted the officers charged with his care. He even spit on one jailer who was reading new charges against him at the time. The judge admonished him and stated that if he refused to attend any future hearings, they would proceed without him. Because of his inability to comply and conform within the system, his request to again represent himself was summarily denied. Manel was adept at stalling the early legal proceedings against himself and often tried to have hearings postponed by feigning interest in taking a plea deal. And despite the forensic evidence linking him directly to the crime scene, he continued to maintain his innocence. But before he was set to go to trial, he was again offered a plea deal to spare his son the trauma of testifying against his own father in the courtroom and from reliving the tragedy that occurred in the family trailer just two Christmases ago. Manal countered the plea with a second-degree murder conviction. He was only willing to serve 15 years in prison, but the state quickly rejected that offer. He was given one last counter, this time 30 years to life, with the sentencing to be decided by the trial judge. Manel again rejected it. Instead, he was going to plead not guilty and present the theory of an alternative suspect in the courtroom. The only physical evidence at the crime scene against Manel were two knives found hidden behind the stove. They were both bent and covered in Tara's blood, and there were partial prints found on both knives that were determined to belong to Manel through expert testimony. However, the defense argued the prince could have been on the knife prior to the real killer using it to stab Tara to death. Following the rejection of his last plea offer, Manel was indicted on four counts. Murder in the first degree, possession of a weapon for unlawful purpose in the third degree, unlawful possession of a weapon fourth degree, and contempt for allegedly violating a final restraining order. 
The grand jury also added an aggravating circumstance in the event the jury found that the murder of Tara was, quote, outrageously or wantonly vile, horrible or inhumane, and that it involved torture, depravity of mind, or an aggravated assault of the victim. On the first day of trial, the prosecutor, Charles Wettstein, gave a terse 12-minute opening statement in which he briefly described the history of domestic violence between the defendant and the victim. He discussed the night's and morning's events and explained that other than some partial prints on two knives, the case was entirely reliant upon a witness who was just 12 years old at the time of the murder. The defense's opening statements were a mere four minutes long. Public defender Joellen Jones told the jury that the majority of the case against her client was based on eyewitness testimony of a child. She asked the jury to remain skeptical of what they were about to hear, explaining that children often respond broadly instead of answering questions directly and honestly. The entirety of the defense's case, it seemed, would come down to the defendant's counsel discrediting his own son, who claimed to have witnessed everything. And Jeremiah, now 14 years old, was in the eighth grade and very nervous about testifying against his dad. He hadn't seen him since the night his mother had been brutally murdered. To ease him into testifying, the prosecutor asked him about his favorite school subjects and sports, and they discussed his love for video games and other hobbies. He was just a kid after all, a kid who happened to have witnessed the despicably vile and cowardly murder of his own mother. Jeremiah, what do you like to do in your spare time? Um, uh, play video games. Uh, what uh, kind of system do you use? Xbox One. Uh, can you name some of the games that you uh, like to play? Um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, um, Call of Duty, um, Black Ops 4, uh, and uh, that's about it. Uh, do you play those games with anybody else in your house? Yes, my cousin and um, her boyfriend. Uh, what about uh, your uncle? Uh, yeah, so uh, we play Assassin's Creed Odyssey together. What's wrong with me? Um, Edward John Monell. Now sitting on the stand, Jeremiah said that in addition to playing video games, he liked to explore and play outside, and he enjoyed writing fantasy and adventure stories about Native Americans. I, I think Native Americans are very interesting. Um, I like to uh, write stories about them. Are you a uh, fan of any sports teams? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, important question. Who are you rooting for this coming weekend? That was a Saturday with the Eagles on Sunday. Eagles. Uh, you a fan of superheroes? Uh, yes. Okay, now there's another important question. Do you like uh, Marvel or DC? Marvel. And uh, excited about the movies coming out? Uh, yes. Um, I know you're young, but uh, have you thought about what you'd like to do after high school? Uh, yes, military. Any particular branch? Army. Why is that? Uh, long line of history with Army. Also Navy, but mainly Army. Jeremiah, um, where did you live before moving to New York? Uh, 7901 Raymond Drive. And Melville, New Jersey. Is that um, an area that's also commonly known as Laurel Lake? Yes. Uh, who did you live with at that house? My mother, um, my sister, and I. District Attorney Wettstein was trying to ease Jeremiah into telling his own story, but more than anything, he wanted to let the jury know that while this 14 year old boy before them looked and sounded two years older, he was still, in fact, a child. They knew Manal's defense team would subtly try to discredit the witness and they needed the jury to know who this thoughtful young man was before and after the night his mother was murdered. The other reason for establishing small talk with Jeremiah was to set him at ease and allow the jury to empathize with him as they took him into darker and darker territory. Do you mind your mom alive? No. What happened to her? She was um, stabbed. Where was she stabbed? Um, location or? Was she stabbed in the house? Uh, yes. When did that happen? Um, December. December 2016. You said that she was stabbed. Uh, who stabbed her? Um, Jeremiah Edward Monell. Okay. Who's Jeremiah Edward Monell? My father. Your father in the courtroom? Yes. Can you point him out and describe what he's wearing? A suit. After Maya is shown pictures of his old home, he's asked a series of questions about the floor plan. Prosecutor Wettstein was trying to show the jury that while the trailer was very small, there was a direct sight line to the crime scene from Jeremiah's room. The living room and the kitchen were all contained within one long space. Directly behind the kitchen was Jeremiah's bedroom. At the back of the kitchen wall, there was a door opening located on the left side. It was covered by a curtain instead of a solid door. To the right of the doorway was a refrigerator which took up the remaining space. And while the curtain was open, it showed that Jeremiah had a direct line of sight to the living room couch, coffee table, and TV. The only other bedroom in the house was occupied by Sarah and his mother. In it, there were two single beds. When did your dad, well, you said your dad lived with you um, in, December, in 2016. Do you remember when you moved out? Uh, yes. Do you remember about when that was? April 4th. How much would you see your dad after uh, he moved out? Um, 
every weekend. Where would you see your dad? At my grandfather's in Malaga, New Jersey. Um, how would you get to your grandfather's house? Um, my mother would drop um, us off there. And where, what would you do when you, uh, when you visited with your dad? Um, not really much, just hanging around with him. Um, sometimes we would go to the park, but my grandfather had to come. And what kind of things would you do at the park? Um, he would walk on trail, on trail. Um, uh, we would climb a monkey bar and race with my sister. But you ever talk with your dad? Um, not really, because most of the time he would um, he would want to ask me questions about um, what we, what my mother was doing, um, who she was um, like uh, with, and that's about it. Because of the restraining order that Tara had in place against her violent, estranged husband, he was required to have supervised visitation with their children. The children's paternal grandfather acted as the court-mandated supervisor during those meetings. Manel spent the limited time he had with his children interrogating them on their mother's activities. And despite being separated, it was obvious he still felt a proprietary ownership over his wife. His jealousy permeated and dominated what little precious time he had with his kids. It was clear that his priority was Tara and with whom she was spending her time while he was away. How often would your dad ask you about your mom? Um, every time I visited him. How much would he ask you about your mom? Um, can you rephrase the questions? Um, when you talk to your dad, or when your dad would ask you about your mom, how much would he ask? Um, a lot. Uh, how would you describe uh, the relationship between you and your sister? Back in 2016. Uh, pretty close. I cared about her and she cared about me. Um, how was your relationship with your mom? Uh, very well. Very good. Um, we were friends, really. And we were family, too. What was the relationship like between your mom and your dad? Not good. The majority of the fights between Manal and Tara stemmed from his irrational jealousy of his estranged wife. Despite the restraining order, he continued to stalk Tara and accuse her of cheating on him with other men while they were together. This pathological jealousy would lead him to constantly interrogating the children as to Tara's activities. Despite just being children, they knew to protect their mother's privacy and hide her interactions from their father. Little Maya had assumed the role of the protector for his family, and even just at 12 years of age, he knew the number one threat came from his very own father. Hey, Jeremiah, um, after your dad flew down April 2016, were there ever any times that you would see your mom and dad uh, together? Um, they would have conversations, but not really. Where would those conversations happen? Um, at my grandfather's, when she dropped us off to, for visitations. What were those conversations about? Um, just um, him asking, because I wouldn't tell him, um, asking what she's doing, where she is. Um, same questions that he asked me, um, and that's about it. Would your mother interact? With him when you ask those questions? No, not really, I don't think. Despite the no contact order and the strained nature of their relationship, Manel would repeatedly violate the restraining order and insist on being present when Tara dropped the children off at their grandfather's home. After your dad moved out, 7901 Region Drive, um, would he ever come over to that house to visit you? Um, no. When was the last time you saw your dad uh, before today? December. In December of 2016. Do you remember the, the date? Mm, no. Do you remember what day of the week it was? No. Did you go to school that day? No. Did you have to go to school the next day? No, because I think it was Christmas break. <clears throat> the day that you last saw your dad, December of 2016, um, do you remember what time of the day it was? Can you the question again? Was it light or dark outside? Uh, when you arrived? Yeah. Uh, it was light. And was your mom home at that time? No. Was your sister home? No. Do you know where they were at? Yes. Where were they? Crystal Beers. Do you know why your mom and Sarah had left? Um, they just went down to Crystal Beers. Tara found herself in a difficult predicament that December afternoon. Even though she had a restraining order against her ex-husband, her car had become unsafe to drive and she couldn't afford the repairs. 
She was forced to ask Manal for his help. Knowing his propensity for violence, she thought it best to remove herself from the home while he worked on the car. She anticipated the repair would only take a few hours. Her and Crystal and the two girls left while Maya remained at the home while his dad worked on the repairs. Uh, what were you doing uh, at that time? I was um, at home playing um, my game. What game were you playing? Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. Were you sitting in that same spot that you uh, referenced earlier? Yes. On the couch? Yes. Um, how do you know that your dad was, was at the house at that time? Um, he I, saw, I looked out the window and I saw him walking down. And I looked out the window and he opened the um, hood of my mother's car because he was fixing my mother's car. Where was your mother's car while he was fixing it? In the driveway. After you saw your dad um, go up to your mom's car, what happened next? Um, he was fixing the car, and then um, my mother came home. Uh, do you remember your dad coming up to the door at any time uh, before your mom came home? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, uh, what, what happened when your dad came home? He um, knocked, I opened the door, and he said, I need a tool. And uh, he needed a tool. Okay. Uh, do you know what kind of tool he needed? Uh, I think it was a wrench. And it was in the drawer um, in the corner of the kitchen. And he went and grabbed it and went back outside. Tara had waited all day at Crystal's house while Manal fixed her brake line. However, as daylight turned to early evening, Crystal needed to leave to run some errands and finish her Christmas shopping. So Tara and Sarah, along with Crystal's daughter Bella, went back to their trailer while Manal continued to repair her car out in the driveway. And what did your dad do after he got that tool? He went back to repairing the car. And what did you then do? I went back to Assassin's Creed. Back to playing your game? Yes. You mentioned your, your mom came home at some point. Do you remember when she came home? No, I was too busy playing my game. Uh, you remember if it was light, light or dark outside when she came home? Uh, yeah, it was still light. And was your sister uh, with your mom? Uh, yes. Did she actually come inside the house at that time? Uh, my sister came inside and then I um, saw my mother and my dad um, talking. Where were they talking? Uh, near the car. And did you hear what they were talking about? Uh, no. They're yeah. outside. I'm sorry? They're outside. I think. We, were you able to see them having talking? Yes. Can you describe how they were acting? Um, their hands were down and it looked like they were just having casual talk. Where were you at when you saw that conversation? I was in the back room looking out the window. Any normal 12-year-old might be fully immersed in an intense video game not knowing who or what was around him. Often, you can call a child's name repeatedly while they are playing a game, and despite the close proximity, it can be difficult to gain their attention. But Maya didn't have that luxury while his father was present. He had to stay on high alert, constantly anticipating trouble, constantly watching and waiting, not knowing how or when he might be called to intervene in some way. Being the big brother that he was, he stopped playing video games, gathered his sister, and took her into the back bedroom. While she played Barbies, he nervously began playing a game on his phone not knowing what, if anything, might happen between his mother and his father, now that they were both back at the trailer. Shortly after he took Sarah back to his room, he noticed his mother come into the house to take a shower. What Jeremiah didn't know at the time was that before his mother came into the house, a neighbor observed his parents outside. While Jeremiah only saw them talking, the neighbors saw his dark side on full display. Um, what were Tara and Jeremiah doing uh, as you were walking by? Me and my wife was walking by. Um, Jeremiah had Tara up against the corner of the house, telling her that... Objection. She, Jeremiah was calling her a whore, a bitch, a cunt, telling her that uh, he knew that she was cheating on him, had other males come into her house. Tara told him that she did not want to fight. The neighbors Gage Oslin and Heather Gandy were walking their dog when they observed Tara pinned to the side of her trailer. Manel was calling her a cheating whore and other names. Oslin said he was up on top of her and had her pinned against the trailer. He described Tara as crying and frantic. It was clear that Manel behaved as if the restraining order didn't exist at all. To him, a piece of paper didn't matter. Tara belonged to him. She was no different than any other object he owned. When Oslin first moved into the neighborhood back in August of 2016, the first thing he did was introduce himself and his wife to their new neighbors. He had no idea the day he introduced himself to Tara and Manel, Jeremiah was once again in violation of a restraining order. Manel had no legal right to be at the trailer that day, and he certainly didn't have any claim over Tara. Um, after uh, me and my wife had introduced ourselves, because that's, that's how me and my family are. If anybody, any of our neighbors, we look out for one another. Okay, um, this gentleman here... After I stated my name to him, told him exactly where I looked at, he is, immediately started accusing me and my wife of flirting with his wife, and he started getting hostile, sir. And what happened after you had an interaction with him? Me and my, me and my, wa my wife walked home. I couldn't believe what just happened. I, I did not want to offend anybody, or I didn't have any impression that I was flirting with, with his wife. Uh, a few days later, she came down to my house crying and apologized, just her. Okay.
Jeremiah watched his mother enter the house. He watched her head to the bathroom to take a shower. But he had no idea she had once again been physically assaulted by his father outside. Jeremiah Sr. entered the house next. At first, he sat on the couch as if nothing was out of the ordinary. As if he still lived there. As if this were normal. But it wasn't normal. It was confusing. Jeremiah remained on high alert as his father went into his mother and sister's room and began talking with Sarah. On the surface, it was a warm moment between father and daughter. But Maya's intuition told him otherwise. It was enough to make him stop what he was doing and peek in on them. Sarah was on Manel's lap, and if you didn't know the context, it could be viewed as a loving parent playing with his child. But there was context. There was also a calculated plan. Even as a child, Jeremiah sensed that something was off. He sensed within his father, a hunter. Meanwhile, Tara got dressed and went to the couch to rest. She was in her favorite spot, snuggling underneath Sarah's frozen blanket. Manel told Jeremiah he was going to lay down with Sarah until she fell asleep, and then he would come check in on him, too. It was now past his bedtime, so he went to the living room to check on his mother. He said goodnight and told her he loved her for the very last time. Jeremiah knew his father shouldn't be in the trailer. His 12-year-old mind couldn't understand why everyone around him was acting normal. None of this made any sense to him. He sensed the underlying danger, but still hoped he was wrong. He hoped for a night without violence, and he prayed that his father would leave without anyone getting hurt. But unfortunately, that wouldn't be the case this evening. After Sarah fell asleep, Manel got in bed with Maya as if this was their normal bedtime routine. But he had a plan, and it couldn't begin until everyone was asleep. Having a parent fall asleep next to you as a child is usually a very comforting memory. But for Maya, it was one riddled with anxiety, an exercise, and sheer terror. He remains frozen, feigning sleep so his father will leave. He believes he may have nodded off for just a few moments, but he wills himself back awake. He knows if he can stay awake, he can keep everyone safe. But he's wrong. When Manel believes Jeremiah is asleep, he quietly gets out of bed and stands by the doorway. Jeremiah continues watching from underneath his covers, looking at his father. He is standing in the pitch black darkness, peering out from behind the curtain. The same curtain Maya was peering out from earlier as he watched his father. Five or six minutes pass and he watches a predator stalking his prey. Jeremiah holds his breath, not wanting to alert his father to his level of wakefulness. Finally ready, his father exits the room and moves in towards Tara. What's next thing you remember? Um... I heard a huge thump, and I crawled over to my curtain to peek, and I saw my mother on the floor and my father standing above her. Do you remember hearing um, anything after that thump? Uh, yes, my mother screamed in pain because um, she had a back problem, and she said, ow. Yes. And what was your dad doing? Um, he then jumped on her and, pulled and started choking her. The prosecution asks Maya to demonstrate the way his father choked his mother in front of Manel and the entire jury. Jeremiah Sr. continues staring directly at his son while he recounts the terrifying last seconds of his mother's life as it was extinguished at the dirtied hands of his father there on their living room floor. What did your, your dad say anything while that was happening? Mm -hmm, no. How long do you think that was, that was going on for? Um, wait, can I rephrase the question? How long do you think your dad was choking your mom? Um, a minute, maybe less. What happened um, after that period of time? Um, he got up and he got a knife off the fridge, a kitchen knife. The family kept a butcher block of stainless steel knives on top of the refrigerator in the small trailer's kitchen. Jeremiah couldn't actually see his father take the knife from the block as it was located parallel to where he was on the floor peering out from underneath the curtain. But he could hear the sound the knife made as it was removed from the block. Where did your dad go after getting that knife? He went back to my mother and stabbed her. Which way did you walk to get back to the to walk through the kitchen? Uh, yes. Did you see anything in your dad's hands while he walked back to the kitchen? Yes. What did you see? A knife. About how big was that knife? Um, about this big. And after he had that knife, can you describe what he did? Um, he stabbed my uh, mother. Can you describe what position your mother was in when your father stabbed her? Um, rephrase the question. How was your mother laying when your dad stabbed her? Um, um, full on the ground, um, shocked and um, just not living really. What do you remember seeing? My um, father stabbing her, and um, that, that's all I saw. I looked away. Did you hear anything? Um, just the gushing of um, 
Em xả đánh Maya couldn't bring himself to watch the ruthless attack any longer. He climbed back into his bed, hid under his blanket, and tried to quietly cry. The next time he had the courage to look out, he carefully moved the curtain and watched his father smoking a cigarette. He tried to remain silent, but his desperate gasps for help were impossible to completely muffle. His father heard the boy's whimpers from behind the curtain. Jeremiah, what did you hear your father say when he came back into your room? He, um, he said, um, you saw it. And he was saying, um, you shouldn't have saw it. Did you say anything to your dad? I said, you killed her. And I said that a few times. What did your dad say after you said that to him? He said, you should not saw it. What's the next thing that happened after that? He told me to go to sleep. And did you go to sleep? I just went under my blanket and still cried. Do you remember seeing your father again that night in your room? Uh, yes. He woke me up and told me, um, he told me um, to go out the back door and that you're probably going to go with your aunt and uncle. Or aunt or uncle. Do you know what aunt or uncle he was talking about? Yeah. Who? Um, actually, more descriptive, he said, um, you're going to go with Uncle Josh or Uncle Eddie. After realizing that his son watched him kill his mother, he casually tells him not to worry as he will have another place to live. That he'll have a replacement family. That he can live with one of his uncles as if that could ever replace the unconditional love of a mother. A mother who now lays dead, viciously stabbed to death under a colorful children's blanket on their living room floor. What's the next thing you remember um, after your dad told you told that? I um, cried myself to sleep and I woke up in the morning and I went to the, to the kitchen and I fell and cried in the kitchen seeing my mother laying on the floor covered by a blanket. And what did you do after, after you were on the floor? I, well, I heard an alarm but I didn't pay attention until I looked for the alarm and it was in the water heater. So I tried to get out, to get it out to call 911. And were you able to? No. Um, you said that you had a phone. Um, did you try using your phone at any point? It was dead. When did you try to use your phone? I'm afraid the question. When you saw your father stabbing your mother, did you go for your phone? No, because I knew it was dead. Maya stayed in bed all night, knowing that his mother's body was under his sister Sarah's favorite blanket. He waited until morning when he heard the alarm go off on his mother's phone. His father had placed it inside the trailer's water heater, hoping to disable it and prevent anyone in the house from calling 911. He couldn't use his own phone because the battery had drained and the charger was out in the living room next to his mother's body. He couldn't muster up the courage to go near her. He couldn't bring himself to look under the blanket. While you were inside the residence with Sergeant Craig, um, was there at any point that you were able to actually view the body that was underneath the blanket. Yes, sir. And um, how did that work? So Detective Sergeant Crane pulled a portion of the blanket up so I could see the victim. Can you describe what you observed at that time? At that time, as he removed it, I saw a white female that had a cut to her neck and mul multiple puncture wounds that appeared to be on her torso. Um, I also observed a small portion of blood underneath the body. Sergeant John DeHart did look under the blanket, and he described the horrific sight there for the jury. What wasn't said was that Tara had been stabbed some 89 times, some of the wounds as deep as six inches. She had a deep cut to the front of her throat that went all the way back to her spine. There were other stab wounds to her neck, chest, abdomen, sides, back, and the nape of her neck. The wounds were of all different depths and dimensions. Her body was also badly bruised, which meant she was alive long enough to develop the bruising. Many of her wounds, though, were fatal, including jagged cuts completely severing her jugular vein, trachea, and esophagus. So, you go into the Crystal's house, carrying her sister. What did you do once you got to the house? I knocked on the door and Crystal came to the door and I told Crystal that um, my mother was dead. And uh, did you say how she died? I said my father killed um, my mother. So what was uh, Crystal's reaction? What, what, did, what did she do after you um, told her that? She said what? And then she said no and she went to go get um, Jimmy, her husband. Um, and um, he ran out the door with... Um, this um, kid I know, Turtle, um, his real name's Glenn Atchison. He went down there too, and um, they saw and called 911. When I went back to that morning, you saw your mom. Um, I, th I think you may mention, but I just want to be sure. Um, did you say that there was something on top of her? Yes. What was on top of her? Um, a blanket. What, what kind of blanket? Um, a frozen blanket, the same one she was laying with that night. Do you know how that blanket got on top of your mother? Oh, 
my father put it on her. Did you see your father put it on top of her? No. Was there anybody else in your house that night? No. Did you hear anybody else in your house that night? No. And may I say something? That after the incident on April 4th, my mother... Sorry. 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 What Maya wanted to discuss was the incident six months prior to his mother's murder, when his father came over and destroyed property, violently assaulting Tara in the process, leaving bruising around her neck. The judge instructed the jury to disregard Jeremiah's comments because the restraining order was deemed too prejudicial to be allowed into evidence. In fact, any testimony at all relating to prior abuse wasn't allowed to come into evidence or be discussed at all in front of the jury. But to Tara's friends and family, the history was very significant. It was another example of the court system silencing a victim. If it had been allowed into evidence, the jury would have heard how terrified Tara was of her estranged husband and that she had predicted her own death on numerous occasions. Friends stated that Tara had come over numerous times after Manel had beaten her up. She was constantly covered in bruises. Her close friend Penny even gave an interview to NJ.com stating, Tara told anyone who would listen that eventually Manel was going to kill her. She said Tara was constantly trapped in a living hell and constantly on the run from Jeremiah Sr. Tara wanted nothing more than to escape. She had wanted to sell her possessions and take her children out of state to her native Tennessee to be closer to family. Even though she was able to get a permanent restraining order, a judge barred her from taking the children out of New Jersey. Penny said her friend never had a voice. She said Tara, quote, wanted to be heard and nobody heard her. Domestic violence is real. The other issue that wasn't allowed to be discussed was the fact that in August of 2016, the Cumberland County Grand Jury indicted Manel on fourth-degree criminal contempt charges for violating the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act and a second-degree burglary charge. Those charges were summarily dismissed by the DA in November, just one month prior to the brutal murder of Tara Watson. But again, the jury wasn't allowed to consider this evidence as its value is not considered significant enough to outweigh its prejudicial harm. Often, when children testify in serious trials like this, it's a defense strategy to waive their rights to question the witness. Or if they do cross-examine a child, it's done with extreme care. But Manal's defense team chose to question his son's credibility on the stand, which can often alienate a jury. The defense attorney unnecessarily took Jeremiah through his entire testimony a heart-wrenching second time. When he was finished, she asked him if he recalled giving an interview to the prosecutor a few days after his mother's death. In the transcript, she pointed out three minor inconsistencies in his testimony. There was little gained by Manal's attorney cross-examining his son, other than to further traumatize him and extend his time on the witness stand. In light of Jeremiah's other damning testimony, it made little sense to make such superficial arguments, which in essence were just semantics and narrow out-of-context testimony. In the end, the only clear motive was raw, uninhibited jealousy. Manel was so preoccupied and obsessed with who Tara was seeing and where she was going. It was a simple case of if I can't have her, then no one else can. Manel's actions were calculated and deliberate. All told, Tara suffered 89 stab wounds and her throat had been slashed completely open. It was a horrible, agonizing, and torturous way to die. She wanted it to end so badly that she begged him during the attack to, quote, let me die in peace. Manel, like the wolf in sheep's clothing, crept through the darkness cuddling each of his children in their bedrooms and waiting until each fell asleep, knowing that as soon as they did, he was going to murder their mother. If Tara had lived in Tennessee, where she so desperately wanted to move, a judge would have allowed her to move out of state and away from her abuser. It's a loophole that Tara's mother hopes will be fixed sometime soon in the state of New Jersey. The sentencing judge addressed the loophole by saying, quote, Often, they are initially low-level offenses, but it is the specter of a case like this that haunts every judge's mind every time one of these cases comes up before us. It's the ultimate bad outcome. For his role in Tara's gruesome murder, Jeremiah Manel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility for parole, a punishment that may not have been possible were it not for his son hiding in the shadows, the Watcher. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening. If you can't get enough of the show, consider joining Invisible Choir Premium on Patreon today. For just $5 a month, you get immediate access to over 20 premium episodes. You can get your binge on for just 16 cents per day. No obligations, cancel anytime. Just click the link in the show notes. And remember to add Invisible Choir on social media and say hello. Until next time, take care of each other. <laughs>